Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back or to the 2021 Greater Rochester Teen Book Festival. I'm Caro Fuentes, a student from Mexico, and this panel is called Back in My Day, How Surviving High School Shaped My Writing. Before I introduce you to our wonderful authors, here are a few reminders. If you have a question for any of the authors, please leave it in the chat. Remain muted for the whole session, and remember that this session is being recorded. Now, we are very excited to introduce you to four authors. Our first author is Morgan Baden, who is an established best-selling ghostwriter. She has also taught courses at the New York University Center for Publishing. Being an avid fan of the young adult series, The Babysitter's Club, and a collector of old YA novels and teen magazines, she has a lot of resources on the high school experience. For our second author, please welcome Barry Liga, who has published 24 novels of var various genres, working in both comics and young adult no novels, bringing intriguing and inspiring ideas to the high school audience. He graduated from Yale with a degree in English. The two are married and live in New York City with their kids. Next, we have Erica Moen, a freelance cartoonist. In addition to creating comics for well over a decade, she regularly teaches guest lectures on the subject in high schools around the U.S., giving her insight not only to her high school experience, but today's generation of students as well. And last but not least, we have Matthew Nolan, who has been helping make sex education comics for five years. Despite starting to grade at apparently age 10, he, his connection to the youth by making sex education available and interesting to students makes him a great speaker on the topic of this panel. They live in Portland together with their cat. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for that intro. Wait, what happened to age 10? My graying hair. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Did you pull him out like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think our publicist wrote that intro or something like that, and I'm like, oh dang! All right, <laughs> nice. <laughs> hey, gray or not, just be glad you still got it. I, mean, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I've got that 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 uh, uh, nose peak. Is that yeah? What it it's yeah. It, it's creeping in, and like my my granddad, like both my granddads are like pew, completely yeah. bold, and so is my brother now. So it's like, <laughs> like you know, brother. I've got days left. <laughs> when, 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 when my hair, when I started going bald, like in my 30s, I, I looked at this old picture of my grandfather and I'm like, why was I surprised? Like he was like 25 and bald. I'm like, why did it surprise me that this happened to me? Yeah. So I feel like one of the best ways to kick off the panel about asking your high school, or, uh, how you survived high school is how much do you actually remember of high school? Like, did you enjoy it? Is that possible? Would you ever, under any circumstances, choose to go back? Yeah, I would. <laughs> I think about it regularly, actually. About high school? Yeah, like high school. Uh, I'm, is it okay? Yeah, can I, yeah. Can I go? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So my high school experience, being a teenager, like obviously rough times. I had a rough home life. Uh, it, was, it, it was very chaotic not not great and in high school that's where i made friends that i am still friends with to this day they helped me survive like i wouldn't be here if i hadn't made those friends then and the teachers i had i am still i'm instagram friends with a good number of my old high school teachers and like they they sent they they went out and got my book on their own i didn't even like make them or anything they just were like i got it and i'm like really <laughs> and um I met really incredible life-changing people in high school both my age and my teachers and and my teachers were so good uh they introduced me to thinking about how to write and how to how to write autobiography how to write memoir how to write fiction as well uh just it was, um, You're getting goosebumps. I know. I have, just I thinking have, about I'm high school. About, it, it, different strokes for different folks. I, yeah, I, I know. Don't, it's a different I, experience. I, I, it, unless it was like a time travel situation where I could go back and you know invest in this <laughs> Bitcoin. Bitcoin, man. No, I'm Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would go back. I, it, it'd be one of these things where, uh, uh, and I don't know if I have much memory of 
high school that I enjoy going back to. Um, you know, our memories are, are, are weird things and they like to, they like to fixate on the bad. Um, so it's very tough to remember all of the good positive things. And I know there was lots of that, but it's not where my memory goes straight away when you ask that question. When you ask that question, I'm just like, oh, uh, high school, I can't go back. Don't make me go back. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. How about you guys? Yeah. Well, Barry and I had very different high school experiences. Obviously, we went to, we did not know each other in high school, but we always joke that um, if we were in high school at the same time, uh, we would not be friends we would not, I might not have even known, I mean, I probably would have known who you were. I went to a relatively small high school, but um, our experiences were super different. I personally think the dream is to go back to high school for a day, knowing what I know now, like that is, that is, who, I would love to do that. Um, but I do think I'm one of the rare people who mostly enjoyed high school. Um, middle school, absolute hell. High school, I don't know. I mean, I also, you know, I was a uh, varsity captain of my cheerleading squad. I was on the track team. I was an honor student. I was student council. Like I'm a joiner. And so uh, I found high school a, a, a place where I could shine and join things and whatnot. And that's not to say it was all sunshine. It wasn't, um, you know, there were certainly uh, lots of moments that were terrible, but on the whole, I was not someone who, um, who like ran screaming the day after graduation. I was excited to graduate. Um, and I'm, not, I'm actually not uh, close friends with most of my high school best friends. Like we're all connected on social. Um, there's one or two that I, I'll see once, maybe once a year, uh, you know, outside of a pandemic. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, but despite that, like, I don't know, I had, there were a lot of valuable lessons I learned in high school, um, a lot of great experiences. And overall, like I would, I mean, it's like that Drew Barrymore movie. I would absolutely, in a heartbeat, go back to high school um, for for a day or a week just to sort of get my ear on the ground of of high school these days. <laughs> um, you know, the the I'm not sure I belong on this panel because I'm not 100 percent sure yet that I have survived high school. <laughs> I think the jury is still out on that. <laughs> Um, I did not enjoy high school at all. I, I think one thing, you know, when, when, when people talk about, would you go back? Would you go back? I think one thing that we forget, Matt talked about, you know, our, our memories focus on the bad things, but also we focus on, on things that have some sort of interest or import. I think you forget how boring it is to go to high school every day. Like if I suddenly woke up in my 15 year old body, uh, in 1985, I, or 86, I would probably drop out because I could not imagine having to do algebra again. Like it was mm. fine the first time, I got it, I get it, I understand it. I'm not gonna go sit there and listen to Ms. Ruhlman explain the quadratic equation again. I'm just not doing it. Um, so no, I, I, I would not go back unless I could bring back some sort of cudgel or, or shillelagh or something like that to, to hit certain people with very hard until they fall down and don't get up again. There you go. I miss being a student. I, I, yeah, really... I, was, I was literally going to ask, like, do you guys still have a hunger for, for learning? Because you, you are always like, oh, I would love to go to like university or pick up something mm -hmm. brand new and have a year to invest into learning something. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> oh, I sound like so much work. I could just, we could watch some shows, <laughs> you know, like, you know, just keep watching the experience. Watch some documentaries. You'll split the difference. Yeah. There you go. But I like, I like having a, a teacher be like, read this book. And it's something Give, that giving I giving you a task. Yeah. And it's, and it's something I would never pick up. Mm. I have no interest in whatsoever. And they're like, okay, now write a paper on it based on this theme. And it's like it, the way they made you engage your mind. Like I miss that challenge. And then they would read your paper and they would tell you what you could have done better and what you didn't. What you, it really, but they it work really on it. depends on the teachers and you lucked out. I have really good teachers. Yeah. Um, so that does make a big difference. And, uh, and this does not include any mathematics or science classes. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. What's the joke about when you choose to become a writer, you are volunteering to have homework every night for the rest of your life. And that's what it feels like for me. Like I, I work a day job and then I'm like, I should write some pages tonight. Okay. So it is that I, in a way I, I totally see what you're saying. It's that there's something very seductive about like, writing because it 
is almost like a homework assignment every night or every week or something like that. And if that's what you're used to, um, then that's what you're used to and it feels comfortable and, and like a, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to go back. I think about having like an, a calculus class and the fact that I would like come mm. home and do calculus homework. No, no. It's no, mind no. blowing to me mm -hmm. that I used to do that. Um, so I agree. I like, I don't want to do that part of it, but I do agree with this idea of like, someone is actively engaging with your mind in ways that you would not choose to yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's or it just, cool. it, you wouldn't have occurred. It, we wouldn't have yeah. thought to, you know? Mm. I mean, being a writer is, you know, I, I liken it sometimes to being an actor where, you know, you, you, you're going to be in a period piece. So you have to learn how to ride a horse, right? Or you have to learn how to sword fight, or you have to learn how to, how to dance the waltz, whatever it is you have to learn for the part. And as a writer, this happens to you too. You know, I'm going to write a book about werewolves. Oh, I have to study the phases of the moon. I'm going to write a book about, you know, uh, somebody who's on a boat. Oh, I, I have to learn about sailing and oceanography now. Um, and so you, you, you know, I know that over the course of the, the books I've written, I've picked up all sorts of just useless information that I never would have discovered on my own. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I know way too much about serial killers, for example. Um, but you learn these things and they become a part of you. And so I, I you know, I, I don't know. I don't feel like I need a teacher to, to tell me to do that because I'm constantly doing it to myself. <laughs> I like that authority figure validation where they're like, you did good. I'm like, did that. I? <laughs> Gold star. And you're like, yes. You know, you can get like a sheet of star shaped stickers and put them on your own books and stuff at home. <laughs> Just give oh my them God, myself. I should do that. Exactly. It probably cost a dollar, but it would be like momentous for emotional validation. Yeah. Um, is there like any one most impactful thing that happened to you in high school that you think affected your writing? Well, Erica and I do, uh, we, we write sex education. So I think our first sex ed classes would probably be the big thing, right? Like my sex ed class was really bad and it was rolling condoms on bananas. And that definitely inspired me to want to write a book that did a much, much better job of, of teaching people about sex. Um, I mean, that feels very A equals B, right? Like, like that feels like very much like, yeah, this determined that. You know. Going from point A to point B. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I that's pass terrible. the mic to somebody else. <laughs> What's that? That's terrible because putting the condom on the banana is not going to stop anybody from getting pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, but it will keep the banana from getting pregnant. I mean, it's about banana, banana jokes. Like, yeah. yeah, nobody else is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a, a. So I grew up in a seaside resort town. So in the summer, um, it, it's it's an island, and so in the summer there's a lot of people, and in the winter they turn off the traffic lights and tumbleweeds blow down the island. And there's a, I mean, my elementary class there were. 11 of us and one of them was my twin. So there was really only 10 of us, you know what I mean? And, um, and I think that concept of uh, like there are the locals and then there are the tourists has always played a part in my writing. Um, I said a lot of my books in, Gary's probably going to love, like in a, a resort town in New Jersey, you know what I mean? Just because I, that, that element of um, insiders versus outsiders I think is just always going to appeal to me. Mm. How about you, Bear? Uh, for, for me, the, the biggest thing that happened uh, for me in high school, as far as, as far as writing goes, was um, at the end of high school, when we did the, um, uh, the, the, the graduation ceremony and they're giving out awards for various subjects. Um, and like I got the social studies award and I got the science award and I got the English award and they were going to give out the creative writing award. And here's the thing at the time, you know, no, nobody that I knew was a writer, nobody that I knew was writer adjacent. And so everybody, literally everybody in my life was like, Oh, you want to be a writer, but you know, make sure you do something else because <laughs> you know, writers, right. Writers are going to starve because they, they couldn't, you know, they, they weren't trying to beat me down, but they just couldn't conceive of a world in which in which you could do this. Um, and so I, I remember, you know, I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll go to college and I'll, I'll become a lawyer because I know there's a lot of lawyers who also write books on the side and I'll, I'll do that. So I remember sitting there 
and I already gathered up some awards and then they got up to do the creative writing award. And uh, the Miss Bonica, the teacher in charge of the English department talks about creative writing and blah, blah, blah. And she goes, um, she goes, and we're giving this award to, to uh, a student who says he's going to college to be a lawyer, but those of us who taught him know he will be a writer. Mm. And it was literally the first time in my life that anybody, especially an authority figure, like you were saying, anybody acknowledged that it could even be possible. Um, I and, uh, thought you were going to say the award went to someone else. And I was like, that is the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It was, it was kind of embarrassing. I had a big stack of stuff when I walked off the stage. Um, but uh, but that, that, was, that, that was very meaningful. Um, so that, that was certainly um, the, the most significant thing that happened in, in a writing sense for me uh, as, a, as a kid. For me, it, it wasn't just one individual experience of this, but I had, again, I went to a really cool school and a lot of my teachers would let me do final assignments in the form of a comic. Mm. Uh, and so like in my math class, we had to do a thing about the Pythagorean, Pythagorean. You got to do a comic on math? Pythagorean yeah. theory. Yeah, nice. there, there we go. I think or, or in the Brownian motion. Thing. And, and whatever, it obviously did not stick. But I remember I got to do a comic explaining it. And I had multiple classes where they would let me do a comic as my final project, which wasn't like, everybody do what's in your heart. Like I got special permission for it. And to have my teachers let me do that and encourage me to do that and give me positive feedback on that. And I, I still like my, my comic would have to still fulfill the requirements of the assignment. So teaching me to use comics to communicate specific points. Um, so yeah, I, that, yeah, yeah. That's a really good answer. And it, it just, it, all of your answers really have been going to show how important it is to have supportive teachers around to yeah. help the students actually develop what they wanna do. Um, why do you think that many books for teens focus on characters that are juniors and seniors rather than younger high school students? It, it's easier to um, have those characters have a sense of independent agency. Um, uh, if your book is set in the suburbs or in a rural area, they can drive, which gives them freedom from, uh, from their parents. If it's set in a city, they have more latitude to wander take the subway, take buses, whatever. Um, younger, of, which is not to say that younger kids don't, don't do those things or can't do those things, but it's just easier, um, it's just easier to give them that sense of agency. I mean, it's something I think about whenever, whenever I'm going to, whenever I'm coming up with a new character, um, I decide like, you know, within this age range, where does this character fall? And it's like, what do I need this character to be able to do? More and perhaps more importantly, what do I want them not to be able to do that they may do anyway? You know, um, if you have a 17 year old driving to school one day, that's one thing. If you decide your 13 year old main character is going to drive to school one day, that's a whole different story. There's also, I think, some more um, iconic milestones that happen in senior year that are really helpful to structure a story around, mm -hmm. at least in my real world experience. like every grade could go to homecoming. Great, the homecoming dance. But we only had a junior prom and a senior prom. So like those, so if you're, especially if you're writing a contemporary book set in, you know, modern day, uh, the modern world, it's, I always find it really helpful to have those kind of iconic moments, maybe, uh, you know, a graduation or something like that. Um, and also if you're writing uh, realistic books, I think for me, there's something, it just feels better to have a 16 year old or a 17 year old be exposed to alcohol at a party in the book rather than like a 13 year old or a 14 year old. I mean, it just feels like you're gonna get that pushback maybe if you set the character too young. Not that it doesn't happen, but um, I don't know for, maybe it's just a comfort level within me. But well, it, I think it also says a lot about that character, right? Like if you have a 13 year old who's getting exposed to alcohol at a party, they're gonna have a very different reaction yeah. than say a 16 or a 17 year old, right? Somebody a little bit older. Like it lets you have a different, they have a little bit more experience. They have a little bit more by which to go on. Yeah. The younger your character is, the more sort of flexible and soft and pliable they are. And 
the, the writing isn't as interesting as when they're older and they've made a few more determinations about who they want to be or how they would react to something. So you have a little bit more of a structure and a little bit more of a, this character wants to act in this way. Whereas when they're younger, it's so much more explorative and so much more flexible. And, you know, the characters are a little bit less determined. I don't know. Um, oh, sorry. No, I was, in, in our case, because we're doing a lot of sex ed stuff, it's just like, it's just, it's just more comfortable for everybody yeah. if we're working with older teens. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, life is life, but it's easier for... We're writing when, when sex and sexuality, you know, normally become part of somebody's life, and that's normally in the later teen years. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's where we focus. So all the stuff I was saying a minute ago, I haven't actually written deeply about know. You know, <laughs> fiction or anything like that. We haven't like, done any fictional young adult stuff. Mary and Morgan are the ones to ask. <laughs> their, their answers, really clever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's down here. Yeah. No, I, A, I think that was super, uh, a, a super great point. Um, I think overall, there's sort of, um, it's sort of known in the industry that there's a dearth of younger YA books, right? It feels like there's really solid, amazing middle grade options. And then there's YA and most of the YA f skews older, right? Like 16, 17. Um, I've certainly seen in the industry that there are, it, there's been pushback about like, well, where are the YA novels for, um, for the 13, 14 year olds or 12, 13, 14. Um, and I, I also want to add that I think maybe one of the issues too is that uh, the span between 13 year olds can be huge. Like mm -hmm. I know a 13 year old who still plays with Barbies and is, um, you know, a young 13. And then there are much more mature 13s. And so I think that's a really tricky bridge to cross too, is if you're writing a book about a 13, 14 year old, um, I don't know, I, a lot of 13 year old readers are going to be like, this is just like me and my friends. But the other half are going to be like, who is this person? This is nothing like me and my friends. That's why the, the one question I hate getting above any others is what age yes. is, your book, is your book for? Mm. I'm like, I don't know. Well, who's the kid? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, it, if it connects I, to you, it connects no to you. Right. Yeah. 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 So That's the next question is for Barry. Uh, what age is your book for? <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I do actually have a question just for Morgan, though. It was um, one of our students is really curious about why you would want to be a ghostwriter and give somebody else the credit for your writing. Oh, that's a great question. Um, ghostwriting sort of fell into my lap um, a million years ago. No. Um, so I was one of those like wannabe writers who always kept working on something but could never finish it. Um, so I had a day job, but on, you know, on the side, I was taking writing classes and, and pretending to start all these books. Um, and then I was asked to sample for a, for a very well-known, um, YA series. And what that meant was they handed me like a three page outline and they were like, write a chapter. Um, so I did it and I was able to, to match the tone of the rest of the books really well. And so I got hired to write the whole book. And then that led to another job, which led to another job. And I will say, um, well, A, you have to take your ego out of it, of course, because your book is not, your name is not going on that book and you have to be okay with that. B, you get a paycheck out of it, which is the bonus, right? But C, it really taught, that was, I consider that ghost, that first book I ghost write, wrote to be like a masterclass in fiction writing. I was given five weeks to turn a 20 page outline into a 60,000 word book, five weeks. Crikey. It was working full time. So Ooh. yes, so I would wake up at six, write for an hour, go to work, come home, have dinner, and then write until 11 o'clock at night. And thank God it was only five weeks because that is not sustainable, right? Oh. And I didn't have kids, so that was, thank goodness for that. But, um, but it really, like, it taught me so much, not just about meeting deadlines and about writing, but about the fact that the problem with my own writing was that I could not finish a book because I could not get myself to advance the story. And when someone gave me the blueprint on how to do that for this other book, yeah. it clicked. And I was like, oh, I have to actually like have some action here. That will help me get to the next chapter. Oh, that's what I was missing. So, so I truly just, I, it was such a great learning experience. 
Um, and then, like I said, it led to a couple more jobs. Um, and that was truly wonderful. And I also think that's what helped me get my first agent too. So then when I was ready to query my first actual novel under my own name, um, that was a great credit that really, I think, helped me stand out with agents. But the best thing about this, I'm going to jump in here. The best thing about this is that, you know, she's ghostwritten a few books, but my favorite is the review that said of the one that you wrote said, this is the best book in the series. Why is this one so much better than all the other ones? And I'm like, because somebody else wrote it. <laughs> but I have a professional question for you. So I don't know the, the logistics of how ghostwriting works, but so you, you ghostwrite your book. And internally, somebody at that company will be like, oh, yeah, give her another job, keep that coming. But if you want to ghostwrite elsewhere, do you have a resume that says, I ghostwrote those books? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. okay. So you, so you I, do get to claim that somewhere. Correct. Yes. I, okay. I get to claim it internally. So like when my agent pitches my new book to editors, mm -hmm. she absolutely includes in the pitch, Morgan is a ghostwriter of XYZ. Now, what stops somebody else from coming in and being like, oh, yeah, I ghostwrote that book by Barack that one, Obama. That one was me. Like, how do they verify that? <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, listen, publishing is kind of a small industry. In yeah, general. no, that's true. Yeah, and there are book packaging companies. Um, and so people know, you know, editors, fiction editors know which books come from which book packagers. So, um, you know, it's pretty easy to verify. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really interesting. I've never really considered ghostwriting that much, but now I'm like, Oh, huh. That, that, it's, it's a really interesting, like, way to get into it. And it is, yeah. especially, like, uh, the learning method, like, behind it, the crash yeah. course. That yeah. sounds amazing. Totally. Um, what is the most important message that you wish to convey to teen readers who read your work? Uh, mine would be that everything that what you're feeling uh, about the world of sex and um, all the things that are going on in your life, um, those feelings, it's okay to have those feelings. It's okay to think the things that you think. Um, yeah, that's my, my big thing. God, I just have a joke answer. It's like, do as I say, not as I do. Am I right? <laughs> oh, that's oh. terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it would be that you're, you have an entire life ahead of you and it can feel like, oh, everybody's having sex or, or they're experimenting or they're drinking or they're smoking. And do I need to do that now? And maybe I don't want to, but I, I don't feel great about this. I'm not actually interested in this, but am I missing out? Am I being held back by not doing this? And like, you have your whole life. You have your whole life to try the things you want to try. And there's no, there's, there's no, no time timeline. Frame. There's yeah. no, there's no deadline. And you are going to change so much over the decades. And some things are going to stay the same. Like you do have a core part of you that, that will stay with you your entire life. And a lot of the rest of that, like you will become passionate about things and that passion is real and, and you are genuine. And in the next decade, you may phase out of it. And that doesn't mean that what you experienced and felt and, and, and were doing back then like was a phase, it didn't count. Like, no, that's real, it's valid. And also throughout your life, you're going to have a lot of different things that you become passionate about and invested in. And some things may stop being true for you that you experienced in your younger years. And when you grow out of something, Again, that doesn't invalidate what you had before. It's still real, it's still valid, and it's okay to progress in your life and to go down a different branch and to explore other identities and realities that are true for you now at this stage in your life. And that will continue, like- So, so boiling it down, sorry. Em embrace change and- Yeah, like be be open to change yeah. and, and it-, it the, Life is really, really long. You have a lot of time to to find what's true for you in each decade. Yeah. Along with that, I would say um, there's a universality in all of our experiences as teens, right? Um, no matter where you're from or what you do or who you are, there are common elements and that's what connects us. And that's what I always try to get across in a book too. Um, 
but primarily what I want readers to take away, and this is really similar to, um, to what you just said, is this idea that there is life beyond high school. So, um, you know, it's really, high school is really important when you're in high school. And as, as you're out of high school, it becomes increasingly less important and less meaningful. And, you know, that doesn't mean the relationships aren't meaningful or what the learnings or anything like that, but those sort of day-to-day -day moments um, that feel so huge when you're 15, uh, when you're 30, you're going to be sitting on a Zoom and being like, I can't remember what it felt like to be 15, or I can't remember how that moment felt for me. Um, and so that's what I, I hope to capture when I write. Uh, hmm. You know, <laughs> I, I generally don't think about the reader a lot. <laughs> um, I think one of the primary reasons I write is because I've always said that the world would be a better place if everybody spent five minutes a day just trying to picture the world from somebody else's point of view. Mm. Um, and uh, so that, that's what I aim for in a book is I, I want you to read the book and uh, see the world through somebody else's eyes for however long it takes you to read that book. Um, and, and that does not always mean that it, I want you to agree with that person. It doesn't mean I want you even to identify with that person or to think that person is good. Um, it's just valuable to think about the world from a different perspective, no matter what that perspective is, because it'll, it opens you up to thinking about it from many perspectives in that case. So uh, I would tell a, a teen reader who's looking at one of my books, it's not about you. <laughs> don't go into it looking, for, don't, don't, don't think of this book as a mirror, it's a window. That's a really interesting point. Um, was it a conscious choice for you to write for teens or did you just naturally gravitate towards the age group? Barry, I love your story about this. I, I mean, I, uh, until a couple of years ago, I thought I was still 15. Uh, <laughs> I would wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and sort of, you know, have a jump, jump scare there. Cause um, I was like, Where'd the hair go? Um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I sort of stumbled into it. I had I had written a couple of uh, of novels that my writers group would say, "Well, how old are these characters?" And I said, "They're they're in my eh, they're in their twenties. And they would say, "They don't sound like they're in their twenties. They sound like teenagers. You, you should write YA." And um, I am old enough that when I was a kid, there was no such thing as YA. And if you read books written and aimed at teenagers, it meant you were an idiot. Um, and um, so I had this attitude of, I'm not going to do that. And then I, I read this, this really fun book called The True Meaning of Cleavage by Mariah Fredericks. Um, and I was like, oh, this is a good book. Like, you're allowed to write good books for teenagers now? And uh, it's, I sort of fell into it um, that way. Um, and I... But I, I always like to say I don't write books for teenagers. I write books about teenagers. Um, and if teenagers like to read them, that's great. But I'm not writing them for anybody. Uh, I write them for me, to be quite honest with you. Um, and, and I'm lucky that enough other people in the world want to read them that, that I can make a living at it. But I, I never think to myself, now I should write a book that will thrill the youth of today. I'm 50 years old. What the hell do I know about the youth of today? <laughs> it's kind of uh it's kind of uh completely the opposite with us right we, we we do these books that are meant for uh teens to be able to put themselves into you know yep. we, we do comics too so our our characters are supposed to be enough they have enough character in them that that they don't feel empty but they don't have too much so that the reader can put themselves into that character yeah. and sort of live through that character and, and learn something, right? The current book has two teens, every chapter, one will have a, a question and the other one will be, will have the advice. And so we, we have space for, for, for a person to sort of put themselves into someone who's, who's got this problem or who is advising and we kind of help and teach and sort of empower teens to have this conversation. So it's kind of really different compared to what you do, Barry and, and, and Morgan. It's, it's, it's all, you know, 
different 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 sides of the coin. And then the reason why we we did this latest book, which is specifically for teens, is because we spent the previous eight some years doing sex ed comics that were for people who were more like young adults. I mean, I mean more like uh, old, 18 yeah. and, and up. Definitely mm -hmm. for people in their 20s. And we were using lots of, you know, our sense of humor and our our just they were comics that were not meant for teens and we had all these parents come up and be like listen love what you're doing viable information would like to give it to my kids but can't could you make something for teens so we uh we we, we did it at um we were compelled into it <laughs> um and for me it was a little bit different it was um so I was like I said, trying to write, and I kept, this was like the height of chiclet. Um, so I was trying to write like, you know, 20 something fiction when I was a 20 something. And then I switched jobs and um, started working at Scholastic. And um, it was so fortuitous, the timing, because I joined um, in 2008, which was really just as YA was about to burst, right? So the Hunger Games came out in 2010. So there's this like rise up to the Hunger Games. Um, obviously Twilight was out and obviously Harry, but um, what happened was I kept stopping and starting different books, always a 20 something protagonist, and then started working at Scholastic where I was of course surrounded by amazing YA. And suddenly I was like, oh, I should be writing YA. Like that's what I should be doing. It hadn't even occurred to me before then. Um, so that's when I started writing it. And, um, you know, it's funny, I really, uh, I'm laughing at the intro I was given, which I guess I wrote about like my collection of old, I do, I collect vintage, vintage 80s and 90s. That's where we are now. Is that the 90s of vintage? But um, YA novels, and they are, it, it is a delight going back in time and reading those. And then even through the pandemic, my, my stress buying, my stress coping is buying vintage magazines on eBay. Um, and again, vintage 80s and 90s. But it, it just fills this like a hole inside of me that I didn't know I had. And, um, and that's what, you know, I don't know, that's what writing YA feels like was like, oh, right, this whole time, that's what, what I should have been writing. Um, so it's a pleasure. And that's not to say I'll never write something for a non-YA audience, of course, but, um, but yeah, I, my heart really lies in that teenage experience. I believe teenage girls will save the world. And so that is always where my energy wants to go. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> um, looks like we only have five minutes left. Um, oh and I think I'm almost out of questions. I think I've gone through all but one of them and I was saving it for the end, which is nice. Um, What's one thing you know now that you wish you could tell your high school self? Take up space. We were, I was talking about this a little bit in, in the last panel. Um, I think this generation of teens in particular are emboldened and empowered to take up the space they need to, um, to make their mark on the world. I don't think previous generations were, um, on the whole, obviously, broadly speaking, necessarily aware of the power that they hold, um, that we held. And so, I, I don't know, I think uh, for a lot of us, being a teenager is about um, compacting ourselves so that we're not uh, making waves or we're not offending people or we're not certainly not uh, getting attention put on us. Um, and I think that is changed a lot. And so I, I want, I don't know, I just want teenagers to take up the space that they want to take up, however comfortable they are with that. Um, however big or small that space is, like show us who you are, um, use your voice and, and uh, take a stand. I'd say use a pen name. A pen name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. someday there will be Google and it would just be nice to have a separation between have a little more your, you as a human and you an, as an, an anonymity yeah. embrace anonymity yeah use a pen name mine would be to say again it's the same note I said before so I didn't want to say it again but you know every it'll be things are going to be okay it's okay to feel the things that you feel it's you know things I don't want to say things will get better because that's not always true but mm -hmm. 
it's, it's, it, is, it is a feeling that I want to try to get into more people's heads that, that you know, it, it can get better. It, it, you know, be hopeful, be positive, um, you know, things, it's okay to feel the way you do and it's okay the, what's happening in your life. I, I don't know, the very um, uh, abstract messages, not really, not really that useful, you know, but. No, I mean, I would, if I could talk to my teenage self, I'd pr probably two things. One is not necessarily it, it, it's going to get better, but it's going to be better than you think. Mm. All of this, it's going to work out much better than you think. And um, second of all, um, the prequels are going to suck. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you, you got, I wish I'd been warned. That's all. I remember I was in ninth grade when, when the first prequel no. came out. And my friend and I went to the, the we saw it in theaters, like maybe not the first day, but the first week. And it was just, I came out of it trying to like talk my, talking myself into like, no, it was okay. Yeah, no. Oh, that's what I did. I was much older than ninth grade. Believe me. Um, I was gainfully employed. Um, and I saw it that first night and I walked out and I was, I was doing everything I could to convince myself that I had just seen a great movie. Because most of, because I realized most of my life had been all about waiting for the next Star Wars movie. <laughs> so I was so, like, I uh, had to convince myself. Slightly personal question. You mentioned you have, you have kids. Mm, are yeah. you going to, when, have you already? Or when are you going to crack out those prequels for your kids? Thank I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how old your kids are, but <laughs> okay, I imagine okay. the introduction to Jar Jar is a big family decision. So, for, so for, first of all, um, they have not seen any of the movies yet. They're, they're a little too young and I am waiting. My best friend has my original VHS copies of the original non-special editions. Hey. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting to get them back to show them to them. So that, that's first of all. Okay. Second of all, second of all, this is all I'll tell you. My niece, who is, who is a, a teenager, uh, she saw the original trilogy and got to the end of Return of the Jedi and looked at her brother, my, looked at her father, my brother, and said, wow, like, I wonder you know, what, what kind of story would there be about why Darth Vader turned evil? And I said, there's only one responsible answer to that as a parent. And that answer is, no one knows, sweetie. Ah. So that tells you how, how I will treat the prequels. There you go. Have you heard the, um, the machete viewing order, though? Oh, that I know, the machete, machete order. I know, no. I, I'm it, just going to... It gonna... the blow. That's how I first watched them. <laughs> it, it makes them slightly more tolerable because you still have the third, or the third movie to come out, sixth movie altogether to look forward to when you finally yeah. finally get through poor morgan it's like yeah. you're talking a different language it's like, I know. oh sorry <laughs> the, 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 the machete order, order is I think watching they're talking them. about star wars but i don't know for sure so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> the machete order is four five one two three six so after yeah. right after you find out the big spoiler yeah. then you go through and see yeah. the prequels to see how it all happens, yeah. and then you get to go back and watch an actually yeah. good movie after, afterwards. Oh, yeah. I'd never heard of that actually. I yeah. probably had, but yeah. it was a. Uh, I think it originated on a forum somewhere. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Harry's in charge of getting our kids into Star Wars. I'm in charge <laughs> of getting our kids into Harry Potter because he's never read <laughs> Harry. So those are our like respective areas when it comes. We each have our domains of responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> so so are you, will, uh, again, uh, another personal question. Are you going to crack in? Are you going to open up the books first? Do you start with the movies? Oh, yeah. There's, which the book. one? Books, books first? Okay. okay. Oh yeah. 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 Okay, That's good when parenting. Are going to show them <laughs> Lord of the Rings? Much later. They're, they're little. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. They're, 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 they're still very small, so. Yeah. I think we're only going to do the movies for that one. They're, they're, they're not ready to learn Elvish yet. Yeah. <laughs> we're My first to memory is the watching the Battle of Helm's I was going to make the same so. joke. We should get married. Yeah. Go All on. right. Uh, we've hit a minute over. So. Okay. Ooh. Yep, we're gonna have to wrap it up. We just want to thank all of our offers for all those amazing uh, talks about uh, writing through high school experience and also all of the other stuff in between. Um, and we just want to remind everyone that uh, you can head off now. Um, and we have an ending panel, I think, that's happening right after this one um, that everyone can join and uh, sign off. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thanks.